Lord Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for the privilege to be in your house. Thank you for air conditioning. Lord, we thank you for um, just all the many blessings that you have. And Lord, we know that there are people hurting in this room and there are people with inf um, infirmities. And Lord, there are, there are those who have burdens on their hearts. And so Lord, we just thank you for that, that they're here in your house today and that we can just pause from the ugh, life and just come together um, with other saints and just enjoy reading your word and studying your word and singing and praising you. Um, just taking a brief moment out of our week um, and just corporately as the body, like the angels are doing in heaven right now, praising your name through word and deed and song. And we lift your name high for you are only the only one worthy to be worshipped. And we pray this in your most holy son Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Bill's going to take us through week two. Yes. No, we didn't make that announcement in here because they're going to cover that pretty, pretty uh, extensively in the service. All right. Good morning, everyone. We are going to continue in our study of angels. A little review, maybe, of... See, well, no. we don't want everything to work every week. Yeah. Oh, yeah, maybe if I operate the equipment correctly. No, it's on. Yeah, it's on. <laughs> oh. oh, all right. Angels, what are they? Quick review. Who were they created by? God, right. Were they created uh, before us? Yep, we know that. They're accountable to God, and they are significantly different than other created beings, right? We talked about that. What are the three things that they're, they're uh, how they're different? Spiritual, yeah, it's right up there. They're spiritual beings, right? Invisible beings and supernatural beings. Now, are they always invisible? No, they're not always, right? They've, they've appeared to... To people, right? So sometimes unwittingly, right? We don't know, right? If, if we're <clears throat> entertaining an angel, but other times it's quite evident that it's an angel. I really wish this was working. <laughs> All right. So it says that they're innumerable. Does that mean that God doesn't know how many angels he created? No, he knows. God knows, right? But there's so many of them that we don't know. I mean, there are tens of thousands upon thousands upon thousands, so it's like trying to count the stars. No way. They're weak, right? Weak beings. Oh, powerful. Powerful beings, yeah. We see example where, what, 185,000 soldiers were killed by how many angels? One. Yeah, pretty powerful. They cannot procreate, so they don't Angels don't have other angel babies, right? <clears throat> okay. <laughs> All right. Lynn, Lynn's starting already. Now, you just you just gave Charlie the warning for next week. Now, Lynn's already bringing up Genesis 6. Lynn, leave Charlie alone. Let us, can you just let us lead the class for one week? <laughs> it's her. She's bringing it up. She's, stir, she's stirring the pot already. Okay. Angels are immortal, and they are created for a purpose. And today we're going to find out what some of those purposes are. Okay, we're going to go through, we're going to go through scripture. It's going to be interactive, and so you're going to be called on to, to read some scripture. And if you don't raise your hand, then Darren will be more than happy to come over and stick a microphone in your face. Right? Okay. Try it again. Nada. All right. Created for a purpose. Genesis 19. All right, who wants to go first? All right, Sheila said she would like to read first. Where am I here? Up on the screen. Oh. Um, that, evening. that evening, two angels came to the entrance of the city of Sodom. <clears throat> Lot was sitting there, and when he saw them, he stood up to meet them. Then he welcomed them and bowed his face to the ground. Okay, so Sodom, uh, 
is visited by a couple of angels. Lot is, is there. He, he greets these two angels now. Did they look like like angels? Like what we, were they, did they have their wings all out and they were? No. What did they appear as? Right? They came as a couple of men, right? And, uh, and they came there. And, and why did they come? Or what's the, right there at the bottom? A messenger, right? They came as, as to, to deliver a message, a message to Lot. So that's one way that they're, that they're used. All right, this you, comes out of last week's, this is the last week yep. reminder, right, from the Old Testament, the actual definition of the word angel, right? This is the Hebrew word, means messenger. Yep. All right. Did it work? Uh, I think we're, no. Okay. I don't know. She's pushed. Oh, that's why. Mandy set me up for failure. She gave me the... It's a, it's a, <laughs> thank you, Mitch. <laughs> I think I might have to stand over here. Pointing it all over the place. All right. So here we, there we go. Okay. There, we're well, now we're caught up. Uh, as he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Okay, hey, so he, he visited Joseph. Angel visited Joseph. <laughs> All right, so we're going to have an opening video here. Well, we'll see if this works. <laughs> Recently, in 2002, uh, the people of America held their collective breath for several days with news of miners trapped beneath the earth after a cave-in near Somerset, Pennsylvania. And we remember those images on television when the miners were finally rescued and brought to the surface, and there was this collective sigh of relief at uh, their redemption. When I watched that unfold, I was reminded of a similar episode that took place many, many years ago, not far from Somerset in the mining uh, district of western Pennsylvania, not far from where I grew up. In fact, my house was built on top of an underground coal mine. Our town was called Pleasant Hills, but before it was called Pleasant Hills, it was simply known as Number 5, because that's where the underground mining uh, was taking place. But in any case, there was another terrible cave-in, a mine disaster in western Pennsylvania. This was over uh, 40 years ago, probably closer to 50 years ago, where men were trapped beneath the surface for even longer than the more recent episode. There were a couple of weeks underground, and there was some weak tapping that was heard. And again, people waited for days and days upon days with the anxious anticipation and waning hopes that anybody would be rescued. And I remember the day of the rescue of the two men who had been trapped underground for so long, and they were in fine condition when they were brought to the surface. And the morning paper of the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette on the day of their rescue had bold headlines, and the headlines were these, Miners Rescued by Miracle. And here the secular press did not hesitate to call the survival of these men after all this time under the earth without food and water as a miracle. And then, as I was reading the article, there was a subheadline. It said, Miners Suffer Hallucination. Now, these two men's names were Felon and thrown. The only reason I remember their names is because we made the joke that one of them fell in and the other one was thrown. But they, uh, these two fellows, when they were brought to the surface and were interviewed by the media, explained that the reason that they were able to survive underground all this time was that they were ministered to by an angel. And they both attested to this experience. One of those men afterwards became a minister and spent his, the rest of his life going around the United States telling people the story of his rescue and their being ministered by 
an angel. And I read that and I thought, isn't it strange, the dichotomy that we see here in the paper. On the one hand, they attribute their rescue to supernatural intervention. On the other, when these men claim, in fact, they had been visited by an angel, it was dismissed as a hallucination. And the reason for that is because in this day and age, as Bultmann duly noted, the existence of angels is not a part of the modern worldview. They're not a part of a secular perception of reality. Okay, so there we go. Angels still uh, working among the um, lives of men. What do you think about that story? Can you read that? Think it was true? I think it could have been true? I can kind of see it. Right? Okay. Yeah. It is kind of um, interesting how they talk about uh, in the paper, right, how it's, it's a miracle, uh, but then we don't really want to attribute now. Well, now they're talking about angels, so now it can't be. Right? We can't really have supernatural, you know, nothing attributed to that. We, we still see that, right? The world, what I was thinking of is the world will embrace all of these shows about ghost hunters and, wow. right? All this, all this demonic type stuff where they don't, they don't consider it demonic. They think it's cool, right? They'll, they'll do that. But once you interject a story about God and how God works or God maybe sent, sent an angel or then all of a sudden it's, oh, that's supernatural stuff. That's, that's nonsense. Right? So the world does that today. First Corinthians. Yeah, Chris. Did you want to? For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. All right. So what is the purpose of the angels documented in this passage? I remember an angel helping my daughter and me. She was just learning how to drive in my car. A police car came and hit her and went on. And th this, this car chased the police car and said, look, they hit her, she did not hit them. And he explained, he said, you know, I'm a lawyer and I know very well they would accuse her of being the person in the wrong. And I just said, Mary, that, that man is an angel. No. You know how you're talking about angels, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I just want to know what's the difference between an angel and the Holy Ghost? Okay, so the Holy Spirit, right? He's part of the triune Godhead, right? You got God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So he's God, right? Angels were created beings by God. So. That's, that's the difference. The Holy Spirit is God. Yeah. And then he created the angels. Okay. So back to this. What is the purpose of the angels documented in this passage? He's that's saying to minister to believers. But what does this, this verse say? Let him behind you. Well, it says that uh, the angels are looking at what's going on with us. They are watching, so they're 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 um, viewers. What do you call? It? They're like watching what's the going watchers, on. watchers, right? And there's another verse that says, "And the angels look into this." I can't remember the verse, but you know what I'm talking about. So <laughs> they're watching what's going on. Yeah, they're watching us. How does that make you feel? Huh? Angels, angels watching everything that we're doing. Hmm. Hmm. Right. So. Angels observe God's people. So here's your blanks. If you're filling the blanker, there's your blanks. They observe God's people. I just remember the end of that story about my daughter. We did have to go to court, and the judge said, Mary, why don't you say to this police officer, I'm sorry. She looked up there with those big eyes, and she said, because, sir, I have been taught to respect the law. She, she didn't get, she, she got off. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> okay, let's open up to, uh, open your Bibles up to Psalm 91.
We're going to read the entire psalm. So I'm going to read it for us, but I'd like you to follow along in your Bible. Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, for he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in darkness, nor the destruction that wastes at noonday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only look with your eyes and see the recompense of the wicked. Because you have made the Lord your dwelling place, the Most High, who is my refuge. No evil shall be allowed to befall you, and no plague come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you, to guard you in all your ways. On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the adder, the young lion and the serpent you will trample underfoot. Because he holds fast to me in love, I will deliver him. I will protect him because he knows my name, and when he calls to me, I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble, and I will rescue him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Okay, so thinking about Psalm 91, what is the purpose of the angels documented in this passage of Scripture? So she said to guard God's people? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Protect God's people, right? Verses I mean, on 11 your version, and verse 11 and 12 there, right? His angels will guard you in all your ways. We're going to skip this and come back to it. Uh, are we going to skip this? Yeah, we'll do it at the end if we have time. Okay. All right, down to Genesis chapter 3. Who wants to read? On purpose. Oh, it's up there. He drove out the man, and at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Okay. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth, and they had not harmed me, because I was found blameless before him. And also before you, O king, I have done no harm. But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is, the, the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in a public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord appeared the prison doors and brought them out. Okay, so we have scriptures from the Old Testament and the New Testament. What is the purpose of the angels documented in these passages? Shut the lion's mouth, open the prison doors, okay? So what are they doing? Intervening, right? We already touched on that, right? So they're intervening in the affairs of men, you know, by protecting them, protecting Daniel in the lion's den, opening the prison doors, right? So they intervene in people's lives. God sends them. Do they always intervene? When do they intervene? When they're instructed, right? Yeah, when they're, when they're, they're obedient, they're obeying their their uh, their God. Now, a lot of these are going. A lot of these purposes of angels are going to overlap, but we're giving you specific examples here. Oh. Acts ten one through eight. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day, at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. The angel answered, your prayers. Oh, wait, he said, what is it? Lord, he asked, the angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. Is that it? Next slide. Okay. 
When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened and sent them to Joppa. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. Then Zacharias saw him, and he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will call him John. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. Thank you. We forgot to ask the question at the end of that slide, but yes, they're we supposed did. to say, yes, what are the, yeah. Yep, what are the purposes here? What are the, what are the angels doing here in these the scripture? Messengers? Yeah. Yep. They're speaking God's message to human in person or in dreams. And there's numerous examples of this throughout scripture, right? Oh, hello. So here's the, uh, how can angels speak to humans in their dreams? Huh? It's like a dream. Sorry. We were looking for your intelligent answers to you, this question. You need me to go back? Is that, is that, am I going too fast with the clicker? Is that the promise? <laughs> All right, so have we, have we come up with the answer? How do, how do the angels speak in dreams? They can minister through our spirit. They're spiritual creatures and can minister right to our spirit, okay. Do you think this still goes on today? Yes. Yeah. Has anybody here ever been spoken to in a dream by an angel? This could get us in big trouble. <laughs> well, you know, you know, when I first got uh, how to, how to Nathaniel, my firstborn, um, I had a vision of being crucified with Christ. You know, I'm crucified. Galatians 2.20. You know, it was clear as day. Totally clear. So, you know, I mean, of course, they, they still talk to us. You know, and of course, it's always scriptural. and never goes against scripture, as we know. Where, where do we see right now um, in the world where angels and, and even some are claiming Jesus himself are visiting Morocco. the Muslim community, right? Yeah, so in places like Iran and Iraq and Indonesia, all these places that have uh, Muslim populations, there's testimony after testimony coming out that their people are, are getting radically saved, right? And it's through their dreams, right? Because obviously it's hard to share the gospel in those, in those areas. It gets done, but it's very difficult. So God can use whatever means he wants, right? So. Now, can you intentionally speak to someone in a dream? No? You've never done that? No. You never went to somebody's dreams and spoke to them? No? Okay. Who do you know who you're speaking to? <laughs> All right. Let's go I, on. I, I, on. I think when you're studying the scriptures, you also, they, the scriptures speak to you. You know, uh, in Bible study, there's been things that come up, and I wanted an answer to something, and I could be reading along and answering a question. Oh, that makes sense, you know. So yeah, that's why you know a lot of people refer to it like the living word, right? Like yes. you're constantly getting, as you're studying scripture, things are being revealed to you through exactly. God's word, right? Yes. Yeah, and, and it's, it's awesome. Old. And I've had that happen too. Actually, Cindy and I have literally been on the way to church and discussing something. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, I wonder about this, you know, and then we're sitting in in church and pastors preaching, not even preaching about really what we were talking about, but somehow all of a sudden it's on that subject. Exactly. And it's like, that was crazy. Like, you know, like it, like God uses so many different things, you know, and he answers your questions. And as old as I'm getting the Bible, every time I read it, well, maybe not every time, but when I'm really studying, 
there's always something new in it, you right. know? So it's even, even from a passage that you may have read numerous times, right? Exactly. And you read it as one day and they're like, oh, I never cleaned that yes. before, but now. Didn't see that before. Yeah. Now. Okay, we're gonna go on to First Kings. Okay, but he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a bloom tree. And he asked what he might die, that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. <laughs> and the angel of the Lord came again the second and touched him. You want me to read this? Okay. <laughs> And the angel of the Lord came again and the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. He rose and ate and drank and went into the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights in Horeb, the Mount of God. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed. 42 saying, oh, <laughs> saying, Father, if you are willing to remove this cup from me, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And back to the question, what is the purpose of the angels in these passages of scripture? To strengthen us, okay. There's so strengthen us as an answer. What else did you hear? Did you hear in that those patches? Go back. Yeah. Oh, okay. Go forward. There it is. That's the that's what yeah. we just read. What are the angels doing? Yeah, taking care of them, strengthening them. What do we have, Bill? Here you go, Charles. Okay, they're encouraging them, right? Oh, sorry. You go. <laughs> um, can we go back to the previous one? So the way I was reading this one was like, if, I'm trying to use my words carefully here, I guess. But like with Jesus, you know, like he, he's saying, you know, like, like, you know, if you're willing, you know, like remove this from me. And the way I'm reading it, like the angel comes down and it's like, no, you still eat, like you're supposed to do it, you know, kind of like correcting, I guess, but not saying that Jesus is correcting, of course, but that's kind of like what I was like, kind of like got from it. I was like, no, you're, you're, you're doing this almost like correcting, but not correcting. So. Yeah, that's right. So what Mandy is saying for those, that one from Elijah, go back two slides. Don't under, she's saying don't under, underestimate the power of a nap and a snack. And that's true. I don't think that's the intention of the uh, biblical passage here, Mandy. But uh, yes, yes. But here, go back. We'll go back one more slide. Look at this passage of Scripture here. What does the angel do? Elijah's sleeping. He makes food. Right? Right? He bakes a cake. I mean, he, he eggs and uh, the mixer. He didn't even have a mixer. Like, did he have a? Baked, baked yeah, on the hot yeah, he baked them. He baked them on the hot stones. I mean, that's pretty cool. Some of you, just by looking at you, I can realize this must be your guardian angel. Oh, yeah, all right, just relax. It was a joke. But he wasn't invisible. He touched them. Yes, right. So he touched them. Yeah. So that's right. So we talked about angels are invisible creatures, but they can make themselves manifest where they can be seen. Right, scripture will also warn us, be careful how you treat strangers, right? Because it could you could be entertaining an angel unaware. Right, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that is interesting, right? Of all the times that, you, that angels meet, what is the human reaction normally in every single passage you read about when a human being re- meets an angel? They're afraid. This is, I think, the only passage that I can think of where he's not afraid of the angel. Yeah, speaking of that, even this like centurion guy before was afraid when the angel first talked to him. So I was going to say, this is good for Baptists, because you're allowed to eat cake. I, I love this that one. And finally, I realize it's okay. So I'm thankful. Just saying. <laughs> Yeah, but it's water. We can't have Pepsi or soda. It has to be water. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I think we should move on, Bill. <laughs> We're getting off track here, right? <laughs> for your blank, if you're worried about the blank, we selected the word encourage here for these passages of Scripture. But again, you know, these things overlap. So you certainly could have used a different word for all these different uh, passages of scripture. Everybody caught up on what they need to catch up on? All right. <laughs> That's a problem we use blanks. So you gotta wait for people to fill in blanks. So another thing about the passage about Elijah that I think is cool is, this is my dad's favorite Bible story is when Elijah has that showdown on the mountain against the prophets of Baal. And of course, Elijah and the real God win, even after he drenched the sacrifice in water multiple times. And the, the, it doesn't follow the same rules as regular fire because it's God's fire and he licked up all the water and stuff. And immediately after that, that mountaintop, literally mountaintop experience, he's already discouraged. That happens to us. So I think that's pretty cool. Okay, so that's the one I'm supposed to read. Okay, so um, Genesis 19, 12 and 13. Then the man, the angels said to Lot, have you anyone else here? Sons-in-law, sons, daughters, or anyone you have in the city, bring them out of the place. For we are about to destroy this place because the outcry against its people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Okay, now we're on to the same question. Purpose of the angels in this in these passages? Warning. They're warning them, right? Yeah, very good, warning. Giving a warning. Exactly. Angels are used to give warnings. For the Lord will pass through the land to strike down the Egyptians. But when he sees the blood in the top and sides of the doorframe, the Lord will pass over your home. He will not permit his death angel to enter your house and strike you down. So the Lord sent a plague upon Israel that morning, and it lasted for three days. A total of 70,000 people died throughout the nation, from Dan in the north to Beersheba in the south. But as the angel was preparing to destroy Jerusalem, the Lord relented and said to the death angel, Stop, that is enough. At that moment, the angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor, was by the threshing floor of the Honora of Jezebel. And that night, the angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when people arose early in the morning, behold, there were all dead bodies. Then Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went home and lived in Nineveh. And as he was worshiping in the house of Nisrash, his his god, Adremelech, and 
Did you give me these just because? <laughs> He's been waiting all day for me to read this, this whole section. How am I doing? <laughs> Shara there. His son struck him down with the sword and escaped into the land of Ararat. I'm not sure why you had trouble reading that slide. Words were clearly spelled. <laughs> so would you guys like to read this? Okay, okay. Revelation 9, 13 through 15. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar before God saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels who had been prepared for the hour, the day, the month, and the year were released to kill a third of mankind. Yeah, so back to the question, what are, what are angels used for in these passages? All right, yeah, they're right. Yeah, they're used. Death angel, right? People were getting killed. For what? For God's judgment, right? God's judgment. So these aren't cute little cute little angels that the world, right, thinks of where you go to the store and you buy that little figurine of the angel. You know? The the world the world has such a different perception of what angels are, don't they? I mean, even we as Christians, I think, sometimes do as well, because we like to hear the stories about how the angel came and told Mary, you're going to give birth to the Savior, right? But this, these are angels, too, that God uses for judgment, right? Yeah, so the world is going to have a really rude awakening when these angels, when these angels come, right? It's not going to be little, cute little hearts and stuff. I have a question. The sixth angel who blew the trumpet and then told the four angels to do their thing, are they different titles of those angels? So we're not told in scripture, and, and you're, this is really next week, as we come to next week's uh, lesson, we're gonna look at angels who are named and the different kinds of angels in scripture, that's next week's uh, lesson. But uh, in that particular passage of scripture, we're not told what kind of angels they are, it just says the angels, right? Let's go back and look at the scripture itself. How interesting, though, though, that you do see the, the uh, progression, the intentional progression that God has in uh, the judgments. When we covered the book of Revelation, we covered this. There are progressive judgments in order that occur. It just shows how uh, um, organized our, our God is, that he does things in, in a specified order. He's got a sovereign plan, and he will work his plan in the order that it's meant to be worked, in the timing it's meant to be done. Um, it just, again, just shows the awesome sovereignty of our God. Yeah, so if you think about that, I wonder if there's a reason why those angels were bound. What, what did they do to get themselves to be bound? And a lot going on here that we don't see. A lot going on that we just do, are not aware of as, as humans. Why did God want the angels to kill a third of mankind? If you recall our study in the book of Revelation, Jude and Revelation, which is our study, uh, at that particular point in time, it reminds us of the world back in Genesis chapter 5 and 6, right? Because the world at that time is so evil. Uh, what they have done, they're, they're basically you have that second holocaust of the Jewish people during that time of the tribulation week, and the world is so evil that they are, look, we're all deserving of judgment. We're not, none of us deserves anything. Or if we exist, we exist because of his grace. Um, our sin is such to the point where we could be destroyed at any time. That's God's prerogative. The fact that he doesn't is grace and mercy on his part. Um, so there is a time God's clearly it clearly says in Scripture, there's a time for evil to be judged. And at that particular point in time, judgment is falling on the entire world, the entire sinful world of men. And uh, a third of mankind dies at that point. Look, you don't have to like it. I don't like it. But at that point, if we're here, when you read the, what's going on in that passage of Scripture, what's happening in the world, 
It's a holy judgment by a holy God against a crazy sinful world. So what do these purposes of God's angels, many of which overlap, what do they, what do they reveal about God's sovereignty? All these things that we just went through, about how God uses angels, what does it reveal about his sovereignty? Raise your hand, let us know what you think. What, is, what do these things reveal about the Lord? He, he's the one that chooses. He chooses, he, he he's, uses them the way he sees fit? I think God knows all things, past, present, and future. And I think that he, he allows what he thinks is best, and he corrects and stops what will not be useful. And it's in his wisdom and all of his knowledge that we, as human, we don't think his thoughts, he don't think our thoughts. So I think that pretty much you know, says it. Yeah. So how do these purposes of the angels, how do, they, how do they bring him glory? How do they glorify God? They do his will, is what she says. They do his will, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They show his power, his knowledge, his strength. Everything he does, we see who he is through some of those things. And I think at the end, we're really going to see and okay. glorify him. Anybody else have any thoughts? It shows that God truly is sovereign. We know what we say it, but he truly is sovereign. Don't they rejoice when sinners repent and worship God probably like continually at his throne? Absolutely. We're going to have a whole week on angels and worship. Absolutely, yes. We didn't even get to that today. Yeah, so all these things that are used, right? Everything goes back to glorifying God, right? However, he... He chooses to use the angels. It's all part of his sovereignty, but ultimately it all points back to him and points, like you guys have said, it just points back to he, he's God, right? He's the, the source of everything. everything. You know, we, didn't, we haven't gotten into this yet, but there are different kinds of angels, right? And we also have the angels who fell, right? And the angels who fell, the scripture says about a third of the angels that were created fell. What do we call those angels? We call them demons today, right? But even the demons, right, are accountable to God. Job chapter 1, right? Even the demons going before God and having to give an account. We talked about that last week. How is it possible that a demon can, ser can serve a purpose to glorify God? How is that possible? Yeah. Well, he uses them to do his like a tool, like a, they're like a screwdriver or a hammer. You know what I'm saying? They're just a tool in God's hand. God is so powerful. These, you know, he's in charge of them. He tells them what to do. You see examples of that when we get to the, it'll be another week where we talk about uh, the demonic realm, but we'll see multiple instances of scripture, and Scott just said it, they have to obey. Well, I just think of the Bible story where they asked not to send them you know, over, remember when the man was so um, out of his mind and Jesus stopped there and went up and he healed him and he was living even in a graveyard or something, I remember. And so they said, please don't do this to us, you know, and he put them into the pigs and the pigs ran over the mountain. Remember that story? So that was demons, I think. Well, that particular yeah, uh, biblical account, where did the demons not want to go? They'd rather go into the pigs instead of being sent where? The to the abyss, to the pit, the bottomless pit, which we then read about in Revelation. Yep. Right? And this holding place for demons. Yeah. And that's used to glorify God because think about the people that witnessed that. Right? They witnessed the demons being cast out. Right? That, who can do that? God can, right? So the people that saw that, 
they certainly were, wow, you know, this is, this was of God. So that brings God glory. So let's go back. Let's see if we can watch that video. Now, this is, a, this is just a testimony uh, that's recorded. Um, Dr. Jeremiah includes this testimony in his study guide on angels. Um, we were able to find this on YouTube, but we, interestingly enough, we could only find it in Italian. <laughs> so so uh, we're going to play this in Italian, but with English subtitles. You're going to have to read the testimony. Uh, and let's play this now for you. Quando pensiamo agli angeli, domandandoci della loro esistenza, li immaginiamo come in una scena del film City of Angel. Migliaia e migliaia, sparsi in ogni angolo e in ogni dove. Le testimonianze sulla loro presenza in mezzo a noi, sono sempre più consistenti. Questa di Eufie e Leonardo che ti sto per raccontare, mi è sembrata particolarmente vera. Ecco le sue parole. Era la prima volta che mi trovavo a Los Angeles. Ci ero andata per sostenere un colloquio di lavoro, ma come mio solito, ero arrivata con almeno 5 ore di anticipo, ed era appena poco prima dell'alba. Un orario non proprio sicuro per trovarsi in stazione, in una città pericolosa come questa. Ancora più pericolosa e sconsiderata, fu la mia decisione di voler fare una passeggiata nel labirinto di Viuzze, alle spalle del terminal degli autobus. A un tratto, mi resi conto di essermi perduta per i vicoli, e voltandomi, vidi tre uomini che mi seguivano, cercando di non farsi notare. Ammetto che cominciai ad avere paura, soprattutto quando mi resi conto, che la loro presenza, non era casuale, e che in realtà, mi stavano seguendo. Credo di aver fatto la prima cosa istintiva che mi è venuta in mente, chiedere aiuto a Dio. Fu in quel momento, infatti, che alzando lo sguardo di fronte a me, vidi un quarto uomo, che si avvicinava dall'oscurità. Ammetto che pensai di essere perduta, mi sentii improvvisamente in trappola, ma la sensazione di pericolo, sparì quasi subito. Sebbene fosse molto buio, potei distinguere bene le fattezze del giovane. Indossava una camicia bianca, e un paio di jeans, era pressappoco sulla trentina, senz'altro più alto di un metro e ottanta portava con sé un cesto portavivande. Non poteva essere pericoloso. Aveva un'espressione severa sul volto, ma era bellissimo. Non ci sono altre parole per definirlo. Istintivamente, corsi verso di lui. Gli raccontai che ero spaventata, terrorizzata addirittura, che c'erano degli uomini, che mi stavano seguendo, che volevo solo fare una passeggiata, e non avrei mai pensato di mettermi in una situazione di pericolo. Gli spiegai anche, che di lì a poco, avrei avuto un'importante occasione lavorativa, ed era il motivo per cui mi trovassi lì. Con voce pacata mi disse, vieni, ti porto al sicuro. E così fece. Lo ringraziai, dicendogli che, non sapevo cosa mi sarebbe accaduto se lui non fosse arrivato. Mi sorprese, quando con voce profonda e sicura, mi rispose, lo so io. Ricordo l'ombra di un sorriso, che gli apparve negli occhi e sulla bocca, quando gli dissi, che avevo pregato che arrivasse qualcuno a salvarmi, e che subito dopo, era apparso lui. Ho pensato per un attimo che stesse sorridendo per prendermi in giro, ma io sono molto cattolica, e per me la preghiera, è fondamentale in ogni situazione. Mi affido spesso a Dio. Non appena arrivati in stazione, mi disse che ero al sicuro e mi tranquillizzò prima di lasciarmi. Lo ringraziai con un certo fervore. Annui soltanto con la testa, e mi salutò chiamandomi per nome. Mi resi conto mentre mi incamminavo verso l'atrio, che non gli avevo detto il mio nome. Mi fermai di scatto, e corsi fuori per chiedergli come faceva a saperlo. Ma era troppo tardi, era già svanito nel nulla. Credo che quel giorno, un angelo, ha voluto impedire che mi accadesse qualcosa. Da allora, quando cammino per strada da sola, mi sento più sicura, perché so che non sono sola. So I don't know if you could see the, the English at the bottom. It was transcribed in Italian and then inscribed in English below that. So you have this testimony of this girl who was possibly interacted with an angel. 
Anyway, the reality is, when you read scripture, that you can encounter an angel any time and just not even be aware of it. Uh, when they choose to manifest themselves in their, um, in their created state, uh, when they do that, it certainly appears that men, almost every time that they appear, men are afraid of the, the created gloriousness and strength of these angels. Right? We looked the very first week at what are angels, and we looked at the attributes of the angels they are clearly a very different created being than we are. Uh, and at this point, right, they are created beings stronger and very, just very different than us. Uh, but they're, amazingly, they are able to take the appearance of a man. And interesting, when they do, they often appear middle-aged man, like a young, young um, aged man. I mean, that's just kind of how they appear. Well, one time <clears throat> I was in Connecticut and I was leaving like a rest stop. It's the middle of the day, by the way. And some guy was following me out of the rest stop and he was right behind me. And I kind of knew he was there, but he was an older gentleman. So I wasn't really worried if you know what I'm saying, but he was following me. And so I go to my car, I'm going towards my car. And all of a sudden these six people stand up. They were the, the guardian angels from New York. You know those guys? Yeah, so those red, those guys, you know, uh, Sliwa with the, and all with those. the red beret and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were right there. So my little guardian angels were right there. So you know, you often hear we'll hear stories of car accidents, tragic car accidents, where you, you look at a the scene, you're like, how could anyone survive? And there'll be stories of someone that helped or pulled them out or whatever, and then that person disappears. So. I was just going to say, when our grandkids were little, we'd bring them down to Florida every uh, once or twice a year. And one time we were heading north on uh, 275 and this car in front of us, we were going like at least 70 miles an hour, car in front of us slammed on their brakes. And I uh, didn't have time to think about it until afterwards. And I thought, why didn't I hit that car? Well, when I thought about it, because I do not have the best reflexes, as you probably already know. <laughs> but there was like a watery like wave came between me and that other car. I think that was either God's hand or an angel's hand. Yeah. Yeah, sure, sure. I keep thinking back to that accident where the police car hit my car and the man who chased him came to the, to the court, took off work, came to court and testified for Mary. He truly was an angel. You said he was an attorney? They're not angels. I just want to clarify, that's a misinterpretation of scripture. That's a con complete contradiction in terms. <laughs> okay, this was about 34 years ago when my son was born. My son was born with a hole in his heart and severe breathing problems. So I had to rush him to the emergency room in Georgia at the military hospital. And the doctor said he's gone, so they shocked him three times. And they brought his heartbeat back. And I wanted to go and thank this doctor later on. Nobody heard of him. It was not in the medical rec record that this guy was there. That, that was the weirdest thing. Because I know he was there. I know I talked to him. I know who shocked my child. But there was not in the medical record. That was weird. You know, one of the things we touched on today, we really didn't get into detail on it, uh, but the very, one of the very first things we put on the, in the Bible lesson today was that angels observe people. When you get to the very end of Revelation and we get to the judgments where believers are judged for our deeds and are rewarded and unbelievers are judged for their deeds and then are judged and sent to hell, the Bible says that, that books are opened, right? And in these books are the records of our deeds. Well, I just want you to leave. We'll close with this, and then we'll pray. We need to get into the sanctuary to prepare for worship. Who do you suppose records the deeds that humans do? We'll just think about that. Let's close in prayer. And then next week, we're going to look at angels and worship. Angels and worship will be our, our study next week. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. Come before you this morning, and we're just... Uh... Thankful for your teaching, Lord. Uh, 
uh, on angels and how you created them and how you use them uh, to intervene in the lives of men. And uh, Lord, we just would uh, pray for all the needs in this room, uh, things that are written down, things that are unspoken. We just ask that you would uh, just continue to work in each of our lives, Father. And we pray for the pastor today as he's getting ready to preach your word. She would fill him with the Holy Spirit and uh, that if anyone is in our service today that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, that today would be the day of salvation. We pray for them, Lord. We pray that even right now that their hearts would be, be getting prepared uh, to receive your word. And uh, we continue to pray for the peace of Israel. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.